Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Tom Saunders and I'm President and CEO of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. We have a presentation today on uh, our land conservation work. And um, I know a number of you all probably um, are already familiar with the Conservancy, but um, I'm going to advance my slides here. But uh, for those who are not, uh, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we're best known, I think, for uh, protecting and preserving and sharing with the public falling water. But we also do a range of conservation work uh, in the Pittsburgh region and across Western Pennsylvania. And uh, the topic we'll discuss today is just one of those programs that we have. So uh, we have a, a mission statement and a strategic plan to guide our work. And our strategic plan keeps us very focused on sort of our core conservation programs. And, um, and as we do that work, we're also very oriented toward people and communities and how we improve quality of life here in Western Pennsylvania. So this image is just an example of our current uh, strategic plan. And it's nice for an organization like ours, I think, to be so clearly directed toward the, the specific programmatic kind of goals that we have. So we do have five main program areas, and the one today is uh, land conservation. Uh, we also have programs called natural heritage, and that uh, group of scientists protects threatened and endangered species and their habitats and works increasingly on climate change related issues. We have a watershed conservation program that works on protecting our rivers and streams. We have a community greening program that uh, has planted 40,000 street trees in our cities and um, has 130 gardens and quite a number of different kinds of green, green space and landscape projects. And then of course we own Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water out in the Laurel Highlands. And, um, and in many places that's, in many respects, that's one of the places that our work sort of comes together uh, at, at that flagship site. But our discussion today is about our land conservation work, which is definitely one of our very core areas. And one of the things that's nice about our landscape, our land, our land conservation work is just that the scale of it is so huge. So I have worked in other conservation organizations where you sort of feel like you're swimming against the tide, honestly. You might do a few small land conservation projects, but you sort of have the feeling that um, you know, there's more sprawling development and uh, more negative impacts that are vastly outweighing what's happening on the land conservation front. The nice thing at the Conservancy is that the accomplishments over the years and the decades here are, are just huge. Uh, and I, I can say that modestly because I'm still a newcomer to the Conservancy in, you know, in its overall history. And, um, and because it's the people here in the program who do the work so very well. But as you can see from the numbers of this screen, we've, we've protected over a quarter million acres. Um, we have uh, 14,000 acres of our own preserves that we've maintained. We protect 41,000 acres that are still owned by people privately and they, they enjoy their lands just as they did before. They can sell them, pass them along to their children, but we've protected them in a way that they can't be developed. And then we have transferred 200,000 acres over to uh, uh, public agencies, mostly state agencies. And, um, and so as you visit, uh, you know, state properties, parks and forests, uh, those are very often ones that we have protected. So this is one of our local state parks that will probably look familiar to you. Uh, we have a long history of doing the land acquisitions that then for the large part become the state park properties. And this one is of course McConnell's Mill. It was our first land protection project started in the 1940s. Initially, uh, most people would be surprised to know that our earliest work in the 1930s was primarily um, landscape work in the city of Pittsburgh. And then by the 1940s, we were moving into uh, large scale conservation work and initially mostly on work that created state parks. So McConnell's Mill is a product of our, our land conservation efforts and the states since that time. This is um, the Yawk River and Ohio Pyle State Park. And it's another place we're beginning in the 1960s. And then ever since then, every year, essentially, we have added land to the, um, to the state park there, Ohio Pyle or to other protected lands around it. 
And then as we move forward in our history, um, as the 1900s were ending and we were entering this century, this is just another example of a state park that we've done. And this is, of course, as you can tell from the photo, Erie Bluff State Park. And so it also, I think, you know, just to look at those three images sort of gives a sense of the regional sweep of our work too. You know, whether you're wanting to go hike somewhere close to Pittsburgh or you want to go find a 10,000 acre, you know, state park or forest complex, um, they're all out there in our region, thankfully, and in many cases, we're the ones who protected those lands. Now, we've also protected uh, many, many thousands of acres of state forests. And this is an example of one in the Laurel Highlands, where our impact just in that region is about 80,000 acres. And then this is another example. This one is a property we call Hardwood Trails, but that uh, eventually has ended up as a part of the state forest system in Bedford County, down close to the Maryland line. And then there are also many properties uh, that we have protected by conservation easement. So earlier when I was alluding to properties that stay in private hands, you know, it doesn't always make sense for us to buy the land and hold it and manage it. It doesn't always make sense to buy uh, land to turn over to state parks or forests or game lands. Um, sometimes it just makes sense to work with the landowner and to buy or to have them donate to us the development rights. And that way the land can still stay still in excellent private management. You know, maybe it's a farm that's better to continue in farming or a property where a timber company can have some rights to, to use a part of the timber, but, but the other parts of the property are fully protected or that regardless it's available as open space. So this is an example. This one is a, a big easement, 900 acres, owned by a private entity near Vintondale, about halfway between uh, between here and Altoona. And, um, and uh, this one is protected by a conservation easement so that it can never be, never be developed. And then there are properties that we maintain in our own ownership. So mostly we transfer them away so that we don't get swept up into such an extraordinary amount of management work, trails, invasive species and all that, that we kind of lose our effectiveness or our efficiency. But we keep a small percent of the properties we've protected. And um, this one is uh, a close-up image of the beautiful property out in Bear Run that surrounds Falling Water. So when the Kaufman family gave us um, falling water, some land came with it, but we have uh, roughly tripled that in acreage to its current 5,000 acres. And um, and that's land that we'll want to continue to own because uh, I think we just care about having it in, in our control by the Conservancy as it surrounds that famous site and, and is an important part of the setting for that site. So here's a, a map that just kind of gives a quick overview of the, the locations and, and gives you a sense of the scale just in terms of how many projects there are. But these are just the ones we've done since 2010 scattered around this part of Western Pennsylvania. Um, I thought also just in giving an overview for this webinar, it might be helpful just to give a little context as to you know, how we sort of sit as a a land trust or a conservancy in relation to other organizations. So there are more than a thousand land trusts around the state. Uh, you won't be surprised to know that we're one of the larger ones, probably one of the few largest ones. And, um, and then there are network organizations that essentially keep us all organized. They allow us to, to exchange information, to build on one another's expertise. And then also these network organizations help with legal issues or ad advocacy issues or the kinds of things that you know any nonprofit sort of needs there as a um, from a network uh, supporting organization. So in Pennsylvania, there's an organization called We Conserve PA. It's a separate nonprofit, and all its members are the land trusts around the state. So we're very closely involved with them, and they do wonderful work. At the national level, there's a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. called the Land Trust Alliance, and we're equally involved there. They do a national conference for all the land trusts, and they're just a source of incredible expertise and, uh, and shared information um, in this whole field. 
So with that overview, I'm going to turn this over to a couple of our experts in land conservation work. Sean Fenlon is our vice president over this work. Sean and I worked together before in Maryland. He has uh, a long history of doing uh, land conservation projects. Matt Marusiak is our land protection manager uh, in the northern part, north central essentially part of the state. And so Matt is lucky because he gets to work on some of those properties that have the giant, you know, sweeping mountainous, mountainous vistas, the, the parts of Pennsylvania that I think a lot of people are, a lot of people consider to be the most spectacular, essentially. And Matt does a great job at protecting property after property up in that area. So with that, Sean, I'll turn it over to you next. Great, thanks, thanks, Tom. And um, I'll just say a little bit more about Matt. Uh, Matt is one of four land protection managers we have here, um, and his region coincides with, by somewhat by coincidence, with the uh, Pennsylvania Wilds region that uh, DCNR uses, and. Uh, Matt's skills are, are very helpful for this type of work, which can be quite technical at times. He has a background as an engineer many years ago, and uh, that is extremely helpful. My background in law is likewise can often be helpful to get this type of work done. Um, the other three work in other regions throughout Western Pennsylvania. So with that, okay, I have it now. So the first thing I thought it might be helpful for people to listen about is um, kind of just broadly, what are the themes that you might be seeing when you're seeing closings? And maybe you see a news release from the Conservancy, maybe an article in the newspaper. And so those broad uh, themes that you'll see are, are what these approaches are that are coming from us internally. One of them continues to be just biodiversity focus and of course, since Pennsylvania was historically, you know, be, before colonial days, uh, generally a large forested state, uh, it, it, a lot of times those are large forested properties that we're going after. And it, like Tom said, Matt is often the person that gets to work on the biggest of those properties in North Central Pennsylvania. Another thing, another theme you'll often see is that we're adding to state parks or adding to state forests or to state game lands. Uh, we believe that by doing that, you're sort of uh, adding to the value of those lands that are already there and getting, in a way, more bang for your buck that way because the outcomes can enhance what has already been protected in the past. Um, something more recent that we have started to focus on is lands that can be important for uh, being responsive to the climate change impacts that we're already seeing in Pennsylvania. Um, we could talk for an entire hour just about how we're doing that, um, but uh, in short, we try to do that through a couple different means, and we have various GIS, meaning mapping through computers that we have done uh, with our science staff here that really enhance our ability to figure out which properties we think are best for that purpose. And then lastly, uh, since uh, COVID, when so many people wanted to get outside because they had to do something and they all started going to the local parks, they also started to come to the land trust properties, including ours. And it was really at that time that we really geared up to make our own properties more accessible. And so we've been focused on that, but then going forward, also on the land protection side, we're really trying to make sure that we focus on giving people access to the properties so that they can get out also. So I thought it would be helpful with this one slide to give uh, really the viewers of this webinar a chance to understand when we do our internal project selection meetings, that's literally what we call them, what are the type of factors that we're looking at? Well, to begin with, just as the last slide was talking about, a lot of it has to do with the conservation values of the properties that we're considering and whether or not to pursue them. One is biodiversity, as I said. Another would be potentially, is this property better for resiliency to climate change impacts? And yet another, again, as I alluded to earlier, would be about the benefit to the public and whether they can actually enjoy this property also. 
But another factor that we often consider and really have to debate it pretty heavily at times is, well, all right, if we're successful, if we're buying a property, say, who's going to own it? Or maybe I should say, what is going to own it? Is it going to be the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources State Parks Bureau? Or is it going to be one of the other agencies that are public agencies? Um, so we have to consider that closely. And then finally, with respect to funding itself, that can also be very, very uh, uh, determinative of whether or not we can pursue a project. So lastly, and then I'm sorry, besides that is just the investment in the time to, to do the project. So we're often presented by this with, uh, say, a hypothetical 20 acre property. It's nice. But does it make sense when we have a limited capacity like any organization to pursue this 20 acre project when we say have five or six others that are much bigger than it that we could pursue with the same amount of time investment? So those last two factors are pretty practical ones that we have to assess pretty closely. And they are things that we talk through at these project selection meetings. And then oftentimes we're still discussing them later, trying to make sure it really makes sense to pursue something. Another thing I thought it would be helpful for everybody to understand is the kind of broad view that we have from a pure biological diversity perspective of what matters in Pennsylvania. We have been using something we call the WPC's Conservation Blueprint really since uh, I think it was around 2007. And this is a broad depiction of what the areas are that are most important across all of Pennsylvania. But of course, we really focus on the western half of the state. So this is on our website, and it's certainly something we don't hide, but it gives somewhat of an idea of the different types of prioritizations that we have come up with and some of the places that are maybe the most important for us. So again, on a very broad level, looking at all of Western Pennsylvania, one can see that these green areas, those are the state, or I'm sorry, the uh, forests that are most important for us. The blue lines are the important, important streams or creeks or rivers. And then lastly, those pink kind of shapes are the highest for what we call rare species that uh, maybe are literally federally endangered or listed as federally threatened, uh, or if not that, they're at least very rare. And it's something that we think is important enough to focus on these areas for them. And so another thing I thought might be helpful for everybody to see is just when you zoom in more, instead of looking at the whole state, um, how we might actually start to decide what are the particular places in an area that are most important to us. This is an actually uh, an older map that's from probably around 2012 that we did developed to decide which properties were most important on the part of Pennsylvania that's just north of Maryland. That line running through near the bottom there is actually the Pennsylvania Maryland state line. And those red shapes, those are actually property interests we have, mostly properties we own alongside Ling Hill Creek. And so at that time we decided, well, what are the other most important properties that we might try to protect? And so we went through this process and you end up with a map something like this. Um, so those bluish colors, those are the ones that are the, considered by us to be the most important. And then that kind of tan color there are the second tier most important. And oftentimes we use these to send out letters or postcards to landowners to try to prioritize us so that we hopefully get some of them to respond back. And we really are as best possible um, going after the properties, again, that we think are most important. So again, I feel uh, one thing that's very helpful for people to understand what we do is to see what are the actual sort of technical issues or technical steps that happen in a project that can either make a project or, well, in some cases, break that project. So fundamentally, one of the biggest issues we have is that we don't condemn 
lands at all. Haven't really done that. So we instead have to focus on people that we think are truly willing sellers or willing donors. Um, and for those that if they're going to be the seller for the property, the issue there is that the appraisal that we get and all our projects are based on appraisals has to satisfy that seller. So that oftentimes will end a project right there if certain sellers are just not interested in the price that our appraisal says the property is worth. Another key factor though is in most cases, especially for the ones where you have a seller, that person has to be patient because we have fundraising that we will need to do. And typically we fundraise for each project. And that is usually about a year and sometimes a lot longer, depending on certain grant rounds that we uh, go to, to try to fund our projects. Another issue that I have mentioned before is we have to come up with funding to pay these people. And that can be particularly challenging for us internally because we're not only going to government agencies, we might go to multiple government agencies for one project. We might go to certain foundations. We'll be talking to donors. And so partly becomes a little bit of a timing challenge for us. And then there's something that we call due diligence, which a lot of you may be familiar with. And due diligence addresses various issues. The first one fundamentally for us is uh, who actually owns this property, the landowner that we're talking with, we think owns it, but until we run the title on it and take a close look at it, we won't really know for sure. And one issue that often comes up is uh, oil, gas, and mineral rights. And in Pennsylvania, which is a very, very long history of oil, gas, coal, and other mineral development, uh, this can be a fundamental challenge for some of our projects. And in some cases, if something is severed or leased, we will often find ourselves trying to determine whether or not it makes sense to proceed. And that's that risk assessment that we go through. Another issue that we'll do sometimes twice for a project, if it's lasting a long time, is we will do what we call an environmental phase one assessment to make sure that there is nothing on that property that if we were to take ownership of it, that would risk liability to us as an organization. We do a lot of real estate projects, so we cannot put ourselves in a position where we are taking on risks for project after project. So we're very careful about that. And then lastly, and these are usually done closer to the end of the project, we will do a survey because we have to figure out, well, where is the land exactly? Um, and that's what surveys really tell people. Now, the last part of this that I've often had people ask me about is how do we work with our partners on this and these different projects? And one of the things that happens is that these partners are often the ones that come bring the landowners to us because we have a good reputation across the Western half of the state for getting projects done and uh, working well with landowners. But yet another way that often happens is that some of these partners will also be expressing an interest in owning a property. Um, and so as Tom alluded to earlier, we have conveyed away about 200,000 acres to the state parks, state forests, and state game lands. And that's important because it enables us to get more work done. If we had to own that much land, it could be extremely expensive for us. And so um, giving those to the state agencies helps us a lot. And I, I use the word give. In truth, it's really more, a lot of times they're providing some of the funding towards the projects too. And as I just alluded to, Funding, again, is something that we work closely with these partners. And there are really two ways that happens. One, we get these different grants, and that's what I was describing earlier. Um, there are different programs that are usually cyclical, and we apply for those at certain times of the year. But then another one is a lot of these state agencies in particular, but also we've occasionally conveyed properties to the Allegheny National Forest. Uh, they make actual payments to us. We sign a contract with them. 
And when we do that, they are able to then provide some funds towards the project, which allows us to have the money to proceed. And with this, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Um, I, I will say this genuinely about Matt. He's uh, very good at what he does. Um, it really does help that he has an engineering background and can dig into projects and work through all the little, is little issues and little details that come up. Um, and uh, with that, uh, Matt, I'll turn it over to you and let you talk to everybody about this project. Uh, well, thank you, Sean. Um... So as an example of a land acquisition project, we'll talk about the Claremont pro property to kind of give an example of some of the th issues that, that Sean's been talking about. So here's the details of this acquisition. We, it was about set, over 17,000 acres. We acquired this in uh, 2015. It is our, the largest acquisition in our history. Um, we purchased it for just under $13 million um, based on the appraised value. And we immediately conveyed it to the uh, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources to become part of Elk State Forest. It has exceptional conservation values. Um, it's subject to a 35-year timber reservation. I'll mention that a little bit more. And it would have, if we hadn't, if we had bought the timber, had had great timber on it. So the value with the timber would have it, the value was over 52 million. And it is um and, and this property does have uh, oil and gas severed from the property. So this is an example, John talked about a lot of partners. This is an example where our main partner for this was DCNR. Both four, they provided about half of the funding, about $7 million for the acquisition of the property, as well as be the partner that we conveyed the ownership to. Their, their funding then even enabled us to leverage funding through a private foundation to, to fund the entire project. We had the Wilding Seller in this, a Forest Investment Associates was the owner of the property. They were a timber investment management organization but they were willing to work with us. They had an interest in seeing a conservation outcome for this property. And, uh, but also as a timber investment management organization, they also were interested in continuing to manage the timber for some time. So the part of the property, that's why it was subject to the 35 year timber re reservation so they can continue to manage their timber. It, it, it made it financially doable because I don't think we've been able to buy, buy it for 52. But that timber reservation is also subject to a timber management agreement because we want to make sure it's done in a sustainable way. The agreement requires sustainable, that they follow sustainable standards. The agreement also gives the surface owner, who's now DCNR, the ability to audit them annually to make sure they manage those standards. So that's what guarantees, although the timber will be privately managed for a while yet, that it'll be done in a sustainable way and we'll still have a very good, healthy forest, diverse forest 35 years from now. And, um, and this is an example where uh, the subsurface was severed from the property. Um, Seneca Resources, it's, who's the exp exploration arm of, of uh, natural fuel gas, owns oil and gas rights. We knew that going in, uh, in our assessment, you know, we knew there were going to be oil and gas all, on the property, which they are. But we and it would, that would happen no matter what. We, and we figured by April getting this to DCNR, we expect it's a better outcome because DCNR would be able to give uh, more oversight of the gas development than, than if, if this had not happened. And I'm going to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sean talked about different conservation values. One is large forested properties. Well, when you can see the property in a map, you know, it's a large one. So this was a really nice large forested property to protect. Um, we also talked about how it's adding to existing uh, uh, public land. So you can see it was, a, it was a contiguous to state forest to the south, as well as there's some game lands on the ground nearby. So it was really adding to a larger block of protected land. And this was also an important property to protect because it, it's in an area that we considered bridges from the state forest more in the eastern part of the state with the with the national forest in the western part of the state. So this provides a bridge and helps improve interconnectivity and, and uh, species movement through the area. And we continue to work on this area to fill in this, in this bridge area. Um, other really important conservation values, of course, is the forest resources. It's, it's incredible on this property, as well as the water resources. This property has a lot of headwater streams. East Branch Claren originates on this property. And of course, that flows in the Claren River and, and down the Allegheny River, where it hits Allegheny down by um, Claren Armstrong counties. And on the eastern side of the property is drained by um, Pine uh, tributaries to Potato Creek, and then Potato Creek actually flows north from here and hits the Allegheny River in McCain County and continues north into New York State before it curves into Kinsu Dam. So at this point, I'll turn it back over to Sean. 
All right. Well, thanks, Matt. Well, before we continue to talk about our land protection work, I did want to put a little bit of that in context of the land stewardship that we do. Really, there are two parts to what the land conservation work is. One is the land protection side, but then for the properties we keep um, or the easements that we hold, uh, for both of those, um, we have our land stewardship program that takes over. And so I thought it was important to give the context for that. Tom alluded to the 14,000 acres that we currently own. And um, that's a, a responsibility that we take and take seriously. So what is it that we do with these properties? Or in some cases, what do we not do? Well, we don't develop them. You're not gonna see a Walmart or anything else on our properties. There's no subdivision occurring. Another thing that you'll see is that you won't see any commercial activities. You won't see any sort of industrial activities happening. And instead, uh, we have really tried to ramp up our focus on restoration of a lot of these properties. That can take different forms. One form is simply trying to reduce the invasive species on properties. Another is possibly, in some cases, planting native species on our properties. We've done some of that now. And then lastly, um, we often have various debris and old buildings and, and other things on our properties that we have gradually been removing over the last, especially the last 10 years. Another thing that I would want to mention is that almost all of our properties are uh, mapped out and very open to the public for outdoor recreation. There are only very, very narrow exceptions where maybe because of a rare species on there that we don't right, make a big effort to advertise that, that they're there. Um, so that makes it good for us because people can hopefully find all these places. There are in fact more than 40 such places around Western Pennsylvania for people to enjoy. So I thought the last thing I would do in talking about our own properties is just give an example of a property that's actually quite close to where I'm sitting right now, um, close to downtown Pittsburgh. It's uh, if you were taking away from um, downtown Pittsburgh going on Route 65, maybe towards Sewickley, it's probably about a 10 minute drive and you could be right next to Tom's Run Nature Reserve. This property is now 370 acres. Uh, we acquired 55 acres just a few years ago to bring it to that number. And I would just say in general, I would highly recommend it. Um, we have done various projects like I was describing in the last slide, including plugging oil and gas wells that were there from many, many decades, in a lot of cases, more than hundred years before. We removed various old structures. We improved the parking on the property. And we've even added an ADA accessible trail for those that would not otherwise be able to enjoy the outdoors. So just a plug to those who are in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, if you get a chance, all of this information is on our website, but here's a map of where the property is. You can see in kind of the bottom right there, that letter P, that's actually where the parking lot is. And it's a beautiful 3.2 or so mile loop um, that takes you through different types of terrain that are common throughout Western Pennsylvania and really some just amazing features. So I, I highly recommend it. And this is a great example of something that we've really advanced in our work in conservation over the last 10 years. So one other issue I thought would be helpful for everybody because it probably comes to people's attention, we do a lot of projects in the French Creek watershed. And so I thought it would be helpful to understand why that is. And we've talked about biodiversity as being one of our focuses. And in fact, this is a clear example of that. The French Creek watershed is arguably the most biologically diverse stream in the entire Northeastern United States. And that's because of freshwater mussels and fish. 
At last count, I think there were 28 different species of freshwater mussels just in this watershed and getting close to 90 species of freshwater fish. Um, if you have a chance, I would recommend looking up uh, darters of Pennsylvania as an example of a type of fish that's just really fascinating to see that these little colorful fish actually live in Pennsylvania. I think there's one called the rainbow darter. That's the common name and it's just an amazing animal. Other things though in, in this section of Pennsylvania within this watershed, there are a lot of rare plants, not just in the stream system, but I'm talking about things called fens and there are even uh, one or two bogs that I know of in, in that watershed. Um, and so we also have been focusing on those. And then lastly, it's very important for migratory birds. So overall at this point, the Conservancy has protected more than 6,000 acres. And because there's no state park in this watershed and the state forest has very little presence, we actually have continued to own most of the land we've protected. And this is just an example of a slide that was taken years ago that gives a sense of what the French Creek itself looks like and some of the different uh, mussel shells that come from this watershed. And then the last thing I thought might be helpful for this is just to give an example of one of the properties that we actually did uh, protect in the watershed. Um, and this is what we call the Helen B. Katz Natural Area. This particular uh, property has been funded by various sources like always, but we wanted to name it after Helen Katz because she went out of her way in her will to donate a huge amount of money to us for natural areas protections. And so this property is in honor of her. And with this, I will just talk briefly about conservation easements before turning it back over to Matt. Um, with respect to conservation easements, it's a term, or sometimes we just say easements. That's a term that we use to describe legal agreements that are different than deeds, where we talk about ownership of the property. And conservation easements are really a, a tool that was developed starting in the 1970s and really got going more in the 1980s, where an institution like the Conservancy could hold a limited interest in a property to protect it without having to take on the responsibility of owning that property. So essentially what a conservation easement does is it prevents the landowner from doing certain things on the property that in a way would be bad for the conservation values of that property. I make it sound simple, these documents are very long. Um, and nowadays I'm not surprised if they're more than 10 pages in length, but they will address a range of issues from the number of residences, where structures can go, where they cannot go, uh, the type of forestry practices, um, and just goes on from there, frankly, uh, subdivisions and a long, long, long list of other things. So this photo here is a, just a little teaser for everybody is for a property we hope to add to an existing easement uh, in the Laurel Highlands. And uh, this is hopefully something we'll be closing on late next week. This is an example of a, of a working forest conservation easement. Tom showed a slide from it earlier. It's just a beautiful property. It's in the very southern part of Indiana County, uh, just north of Route 22, as you're going towards State College. And this one also, I was just reminded by Matt, provides public access too. So for those few easements that do provide public access, you will uh, find those on our maps, on our website. So they are ones that you can enjoy. And just to give an example of a different part of the state, we have a donated conservation easement here, um, and it's 377 acres. It was actually paired with an agricultural program easement on additional land of, I think, more than 200 acres. So the whole property was quite, quite large and it was really a, a challenge, but a good outcome to protect that much land um, in one project. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Matt. There you go. 
Hey folks, thanks again, Sean. So now uh, after hearing all this, I'm sure you all are excited about how you can conserve your own properties. So we'll talk about if, if you're interested in a conservation project and how that worked from your viewpoint. In, the, in this example, I'm really gonna talk about um, conservation easements because there's been more steps than that. Of course, a land acquisition project would be similar. But if, if you're interested in working with us on placing a conservation easement on, the prop, on your property, uh, first of all, you wanna get together with the land trust staff we take a walk on the property with you, talk about your goals for the property, understand better the conservation values of the property. You should certainly talk to your family members and your legal counsel about this. And then, of course, what we'd learn, we'd take it back and review it with our project selection committee that Sean referred to before uh, to make sure it meets our criteria and, and our priorities for conservation and make sure we have the capacity to take it on. So after this initial meeting, if if we all decide that um, this is a project that works for you and your goals and it works for us and our priorities, the next step would be to actually develop the easement terms of the, of the property. Um, so easement terms of the conservation easement. So one thing we'd look at is across property, what kind of restrictions we want to have. You know, basically we limit subdivision where you, you couldn't subdivide at all or it may permit one subdivision. Um, it, it would also define a highest protection area. So the way the easements are structured is we define different protection areas and each area has different restrictions. The highest protection area, the most restrictive, that really, you know, uh, really doesn't allow many activities other than recreation activities. These areas are like we want to protect riparian areas or have steep slopes or if there's special habitats. In this example, you can see that the hatched green is, is the highest protection area protecting the riparian areas of Carnes Run. And, and then in the south West portion of the property, there was actually some really interesting rock formations and habitat that we wanted to protect, highest protection area. Um, we also want to specify standard protection areas. So in, in standard protection area, you could still do um, for, uh, forest management, uh, subject to forest management plan that we approved. If this is an agricultural property, that's where you can still do your agricultural uses. So you can still get the uh, good sustainable uses from the property, but you, in these areas, you would not be allowed to have any um, residential uses. And then we would define a rental protection area, and that's that's where your residential uses would be limited to. Usually, those are a few acre, bit, few acres in an area where you can just do what you typically do do at your house. Of course, those would still have some restrictions in height, or would restrict the number of, um, for, for example, number of dwelling units. So you might only have able to have one or two two, two dwelling units there. It's really this this the drafting these terms takes a while. We want to take our time again. We want to make sure it protects conservation values as well as make sure as an owner, you really need to think through your future uses and make sure the easement still allows you to do that. For, for example, like the minimum protection area, we might say, hey, one dwelling unit is good enough. Well, you might think, well, someday I might want to have a guest house. So that's two dwelling units. That's, that's probably, it would be fine, but we'd need to make sure we incorporate that in the easement to, so you could be allowed to do that in the future. As we were drafting easement terms, we'd also have to go through the due diligence. Um, Sean also talked a lot about this earlier, and it would get the title work done, make sure you own what you think you own, and can because you can't restrict anything you don't own. If, if you, if you, um, for example, some folks want to restrict oil and gas rights, then you can do that with an easement if you own them. If you don't own your own gas rights, you can't restrict them. We do an environmental review. Um, Sometimes if it's a conservation easement, uh, sometimes the staff does that. If it's more of a complicated property or an acquisition, we would actually get a phase one environmental site, environmental site assessment done on it. Get a survey done, understand where the boundaries of the property are. The survey would also de define the boundaries of the protection area, because as I mentioned, each different protection areas have different restrictions, and we want to make sure we all agree where those different areas are. If this is a purchase easement, we'd get an appraisal done and the, the purchase price would be based on the appraisal. Um, a lot of our easements are donated. Um, typically to purchase an easement tends to require some sort of public access component or as a donated easement, there's no requirement for public access. We'd get a baseline report. So um, we wanna make sure we all agree what the property looks like today. So if there's any changes to it, we all can understand what those changes are. So it, it document existing buildings, what they look like today. Um, as well as the addition conditions of, of the property so we can make sure we can monitor the changes throughout time. And then, okay, whoops, I'm done. Then we do the stewardship metric. Um, whenever we accept 
a conservation easement, we agree to accept a conservation easement. What that means is we take on a perpetual obligation to monitor and enforce that easement. And so we want to make sure we have the resources in order to do that. That's a very important component uh, before we accept an easement. To figure that what resources we need, we do a stewardship metric. So basically, we figure out what our annual costs are for the monitoring and enforcement of that easement. And it's based on the size of the property, how far the travel costs, how far the property is from one of our offices, how complicated the easement is. And so based on those annual costs, we'll calculate the annual costs and then based on our average investment rate, we figure out what is a, a lump sum we need to put into our restricted stewardship endowment. So we have that resources. It's really important. Again, it's a that's one of our major obligations is, is to monitor and enforce these easements in perpetuity. So having those resources is very important. And so funding this to our stewardship is very important before we accept an easement and understanding how much funding we need. So at this point, we got the easement terms worked out. Um, we got the due diligence done There are new issues. If it's an acquisition or if, if it's a purchase, we got the funding worked out. So at that point, we'll bring it to our board for their approval. Of course, all projects need approved by our land trust by our board. Um, more complicated projects do come to the board more than once if, if there's more discussion. Um, but once everything's set and we get the approval from the land trust board, we'll set up closing. Um, so at closing, we signed the baseline. We both us and and the owner would sign the baseline to agree what the current uh, property looks like, and then. Um, we'd execute and uh, record the conservation easement. At that point, the conservation easement's in place. We issue press releases, we congratulate each other, but then the work starts, right? So that means every year uh, we reach out to the landowner once a year saying we're going to come out on this day. We um, Then we go out and walk at the property and make sure all the uh, easement terms are being followed. There's no violations. We do a report. Um, and, and, and continue to do that to, to make sure that the conservation values of the easement is protected and we're doing our obligations with, that the easement is requiring of us. So some costs, you know, even if it's a donated easement, there are costs we need to cover and that, that, um, and that often we ask that the landowners to help with those costs. Uh, the, the survey, the, these surveys can be expensive um, to try and help with some of the survey costs. Uh, if there's a legal review um, on, your, on your part, of course, you need to cover your own legal costs. If you're donating an easement and you're planning on taking a federal tax deduction on that easement, you'd be responsible for getting an appraisal of that easement. And likewise, um, any tax preparation in order to take that federal tax deduction, of course, that cost be, need to be covered by you as well. The other potential landowner cost is uh, once we figure out what our, our stewardship contribution is, we would add, would, these an ask would have of, of the landowner as well. This because again, we need to make sure we have those resources in order to, to monitor these in perpetuity. At this point, I'll turn it back to Sean. All right, well, thanks, Matt. Well, I thought it'd be uh, helpful to at least answer one question, which we've heard sometimes from people, which is how can they protect their own land? And here are some very simple ideas. One, of course, is reach out to us. There's nothing wrong with an email or a phone call, and uh, that can always just start a process of discussion. If we can't do it, though, there are other opportunities, and one of the ones that we often refer landowners to is the, the various county agricultural easement programs. Most counties in Pennsylvania, I think, have active programs, so that's an option potentially for some landowners. Another is perhaps the local municipality may be interested in the project. Seems I'm not able to advance the slides now. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, I thought also it might be important to know that if conveying a property to a municipality, if it's a donation, there is apparently some law out there that allows landowners to restrict the development of that property with the uh, certain type of wording in the, in the deed itself and in the discussions with the municipality. So that may be of interest to some people. 
Uh, another quick mention is due to the what's called the Clean and Green Tax Program in Pennsylvania. Um, that's a program that if you have generally an open space type property, and I don't remember the minimum acreage, might be 10 acres, maybe 20 acres, uh, but at some point uh, you can get a reduced tax rate if you agreed not to develop that property. Uh, the downside is that um, if you decide later to develop it or you sell to someone else who is going to develop it, uh, back taxes are owed for seven years. So in effect, that is a way to have some degree of protection for that property because it may prevent some people from wanting to proceed if the seven years of back taxes are just too much. And then of course, some landowners end up doing deed restrictions or covenants with other landowners nearby. Um, and of course, that's essentially what a homeowners association can often end up doing. And then finally, we wanted to give a, a mention that there are a lot of other land trusts that work in Pennsylvania at a much more small scale geographically than what we do. And to that issue, um, if you're interested, of course, reach out to us. We can tell you about these other land trusts. But if you want to just look around yourself, uh, there are websites that could provide information about that. Uh, we can serve PA is the uh, Pennsylvania uh, organization that helps to coordinate for all the land trusts in Pennsylvania and its website provides some potential resources for people to find those other land trusts. But feel free to reach out to us too. Uh, we do have a question, but before we get to that, I just want to thank everyone for attending today. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the EPC, you can visit us at waterlandlife.org. Uh, you can learn more about our programs and learn more about other ways to get involved with the organization. You can click the volunteer link at the top right of our webpage uh, to see the most up-to-date list of our volunteer opportunities. This include uh, garden volunteering, tree plantings, land stewardship uh, volunteer opportunities. Uh, we still have a few tree plantings scheduled for the end of the season uh, through the end of November. So if you'd like to learn more about that, please visit the website. Also, you can support our mission by becoming a member. WPC relies on members like you to help us care for nature in our region. If you are already a member, thank you very much for your support. If not, you can learn more about becoming a member at waterlandlife.org slash donate. So we do have one question. Um, we talked a lot about French, French Creek today and someone would like to know how or if WPC works with the French Creek Conservancy. I suppose I can answer that. Um, we actually work very closely. The full name is the French Creek Valley Conservancy. And I'd say that we work as closely with that land trust. Uh, that's what we would call local land trust uh, as any land trust in Pennsylvania. Um, we're very, very happy to see that we abbreviated to FCVC, but FCVC uh, really has become a lot more successful now over the last, I don't know, five to 10 years. And, getting geared up to do really two things. One is land protection projects like we do, but then also reaching out to the various small local communities there and try to uh, engender more appreciation for that watershed. And in both ways, uh, French Creek Valley Conservancy has been very effective, but we have regular meetings with FCVC and um, we know each other quite well. There's, there's no mystery between the two of our organizations. Those are all our questions. It might be time for us to sign off, but just uh, thank you all for joining us. We appreciate your support for the Conservancy and we appreciate your interest in our land conservation and in all the work we do.